So when I came to to HKU, I really cared about uh, open science stuff. So doing applications, doing applications with uh, students. And one of the things that was really bothering me is that some of these uh, classic uh, articles um, tended to show that human beings are inherently bad, that there's something fundamentally you know, un- underlying who we really are. There's like a dark layer that's just waiting to, to come out. So a lot of these researchers from the 1960s and 1970s have shown many social psychology uh, findings have shown that really um, if you just give people a chance, like in Second World War with uh, Germany and uh, Japan and other instances, if you just give people a chance, the dark side will uh, prevail. Uh, We talked about factfulness and the fact that we are living in an increasingly uh, better uh, world. Um, It's much easier to live now than it was uh, 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago. Uh, But still, we feel this struggle all the time. And everything around us uh, makes us feel uh, like maybe things are not as good as they could be or should be. Uh, So I started started giving these classes um, talking about my understanding of the lack of replicability of many of these social psychology findings. And my perspective was that we are actually a lot better than what social psychology findings really tell us. To my great surprise, two years ago came out this book. I strongly recommend this book. So Rodger, and we'll meet Rodger, he'll he'll end this class with a video. Uh, Rodger came out with uh, Humankind. Perhaps you've heard of uh, Yuval Noah Harari with uh, Homo sapiens, Homo Deus, uh, 21 challenges for the 21st century, um, which really, uh, like I remember being at the Hebrew University when Yuval uh, did the course and then it was transcended into a book and all that. It's just like it was, it was mind blowing to see how that came to be a global phenomenon. And now he's a, a, a world thinker. Rodger kind of came against that. And the way that he positions this in this book is that instead of thinking of us as homo sapiens, he calls us uh, homo puppy. <laughs> uh, survival instra- instead of the, the fittest, uh, survival of the friendliest. So he argues that we're hardwired to support one another, that the reason why we survived, uh, unlike, let's say, Yuval Noah Harari, that says it's uh, about uh, gossip and narratives and gods and money and all sorts of things that we built in order to coordinate, um, Rodger tells the story of how we survived because we were good to one another. At the beginning, to our village, to our family, and increasingly more and more towards others in our country, football uh, club, whatever it is, but increasingly more and more global uh, in order to be able to survive as a species against all the other uh, threats. So I wrote this uh, this tweet. So I, rem- I remember very, very clearly listening to this book. I was doing like the, uh, the dragon's back, uh, hike and I was listening to this and I just like finished the whole thing in one in one listen and uh, to my great surprise all of, that I've taught in this class is covered with great detail in this remarkable storytelling so we social psychologists really need to discuss this book so uh, since then on Twitter I've discussed this with many social psychologists so it's interesting to see that almost all of the case studies that I'll present to uh, today to you are covered uh, in this book uh, so it was nice to get some kind of reassurance, uh, but I should be fair. Uh, people disagree with God, Rodger, which means that they also disagree with me. And sometimes it's interesting to see some of the debates between Yuval Noah Harari and, and Rodger. And sometimes I do tend to take Yuval's uh, uh, you know, approach a little bit more than uh, Rodger. Rodger just seems to be like a very optimistic person. But if you want to know where this is coming from, actually his first book, which made him very famous, is Utopia for Realists. If you want to know how we can make this society a much better one uh, in all sorts of things, we can do that today. So starting from universal uh, uh, basic income to all sorts of other interventions, looking at case studies around the world and how we can achieve prosperity for all. Um, So they kind of link with one another, a lot of optimism and suggestions uh, for the uh, future. He starts in the book 
uh, with this scenario, which I'll present to you as a, well, what's going on? Okay, here it is. So imagine an airplane makes an emergency landing and breaks into three parts. As the cabin fills with smoke, everybody inside realizes we've got to get out of here. What happens? On planet A, the passengers turn to their neighbors to ask if they're okay. Those needing assistance are helped out of the plane first. People are willing to give their lives even for perfect strangers. That's planet A. On planet B, everybody is left to fend for themselves. Panic breaks out. There's lots of pushing and shoving children, the elderly, and people with disabilities get trampled underfoot. So you can try and think cases in history where we had something like this. Um, a plane was crashing, a boat was sinking. What was the general reaction to that? Which of these two do we live on? So this is something that uh, uh, like opens the book. This is a copy-paste, a screenshot from the book. And it's something that's been running by uh, this professor, Tom. Where is my cursor? Here's my cursor. He's a professor of social psychology, and he gives this to uh, his students. And then he writes, I would estimate that about 97% of people think that we live on planet uh, B. So planet B is where everybody is very selfish, everybody takes care of themselves, and all of that. Doesn't matter who you ask, left-wing or right, rich or poor, undereducated or well-read, all make the same error of judgment. They don't know, not freshmen or junior or grad students, not professionals, in most cases, not even emergency responders. It's not for lack of research. We've had this information available to us since Second uh, World War. So the truth is, in fact, that in almost every case, we live in planet A. So I'll try to show you why Tom thinks, uh, together with Rodger, that we're much more likely to be in planet A, the pro-social, the homo puppy, the friendly planet, rather than the selfish one. Um, I think when many people think about this scenario about uh, a plane crashing or a boat sinking, they think of Titanic. Uh, and I was able to find like a very short clip because it's very tightly controlled by uh, IP. But here's the clip from a movie. Big panic. Who's going to get to the boat first? Stay back, you lot. Stay back. Stay back. Stay back. Don't board. So I don't know if you've watched Titanic. If you haven't, you should. It's a great movie. Uh, lots of uh, romantic stuff that I don't think had anything to do with reality. But uh, beautiful, beautiful scenery. Um, great love story. Uh, and it's based on, of course, a real story of the Titanic. Uh, but when we look in reality, if you read the, the book and if you go into uh, uh, you know all kinds of uh, summaries of what people say about what really happened during the Titanic. There was no indication of panic or hysteria, no cries of fear, and no running to and from. Uh, people were just like very calm, helping one another, making sure that uh, whoever can survive can survive. Um, so he starts, Rodger starts with this, uh, but why, why is this important? Why is it important to move away from the Hollywood narrative of the Titanic and to go and ask people what really happened to see that they've uh, helped one another, they remained calm and there was no panic and uh, selfish behavior. And this is the uh, kind of story uh, that he gives. An old man says to his grandson, there's a fight going on inside me. It's a terrible fight between two wolves one is evil, angry, greedy, jealous, arrogant, and cowardly. The other is good, peaceful, loving, modest, generous, honest, and trustworthy. These two wolves are also fighting within you and inside every other person too. And after a moment, the boy asks, which wolf will win? The old man smiles, the one that you feed. So Radger is making this point all across the book is that if you tell people that they're selfish. If you tell them that this is how other people behave, this is what they come to expect of other people. And therefore, they change their real human nature in order to fend from that, in order to uh, deal with that. And if you look at the psychology literature, I think one of the biggest findings that we've had that has contributed to uh, many fields, especially in medicine, is the placebo effect. 
placebo effect is one of the most remarkable things about human bodies that I've ever uh, seen, the connection between the brain and the body. Just this thing about if we convince ourselves that the sugar pill is a real pill, then we are able to cure things. It doesn't help with fatal things. In medicine, whenever we test something, we don't test this against no drug. We test whatever drug we have against a placebo, against a fake. Because it's remarkable, if you think about this, that just giving people a sugar pill makes them feel better, makes them recover from all sorts of things. It's an unbelievable finding about psychology. Uh, if you want to know more about this, I strongly recommend Science Versus. We talked about Science Versus a few times. This is a great episode uh, on the placebo effect. And this is uh, uh, Ted uh, talking about this. I'm just going to very briefly uh, play a video from him. Hi, I'm Ted Kapchuk. I'm a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. And I'm director of the program in placebo studies in the therapeutic encounter, which is hosted at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. What is placebo, and what is the placebo effect? A placebo is very easy to describe. It's either sugar pill or cellulose pill. It's a sham simulation of therapy. A placebo effect is sometimes called the effect of an inert substance, the effect of a sugar pill. That's an oxymoron. It's not doesn't make sense. It's the effect of something that has no effect. Actually, what a placebo effect is, is a way of describing, quantifying, and understanding Everything that surrounds those pills, the interaction between the patient and the provider, the symbols, the rituals, um, the pills that we take, uh, the amount of support we get. The placebo effect is about everything that's not in the toolbox, but is in the environment when we go and see a provider. What is the therapeutic encounter? When a person goes to a doctor, a nurse, an allied health professional, or a complementary therapist, Everyone thinks it's the drug or the moving of the hands or um, the exercises we do. But in fact, one of the major contributors to the outcome of what happens, what, what the ma a major contributor to why a person feels better is the empathy, attention, emotional support, thoughtfulness, acts of decency, laying on hands that goes on between a patient and doctor. So one important factor is not just to compare against sugar pills, but also to be sure that everything uh, between conditions about the environment, about the people, is exactly the same. And you can see that just having somebody smile at you, take an interest in you, having a professional show that they care, give you advice, is already a placebo effect, even without the, the sugar pill. So sometimes just going to the doctor and seeing somebody and having somebody, you know, check you, uh, measure you, and you know, all that already gives people a good feeling. So you can take the placebo effect and think what the implications are for social psychology in our interactions uh, with people. If we give them this kind of warm interaction, if we give them attention, if we don't fawn, if we just smile, if we give them um, you know, the assumption that we are good, that good things are about to happen, this by itself can serve as a placebo effect. And the placebo effect is not nothing. The placebo effect is actually very meaningful in being able to overcome all sorts of things and boost your immune system. So. Uh, we make the connections between, um, you know, social interactions and the placebo effect. So what we believe in actually influences the way that we are and the way that our body uh, often behaves. In addition to this, there's lots of other cognitive biases that reinforce, which are very, very important for how we perceive others. So if we perceive somebody as being negative, so a negativity bias, we remember this a lot more. People talk about one to four or one to 10. So one bad interaction would need at least 10 good ones in order to counteract. So of course, depends on the context, depends on, on the people. But uh, if we see people behaving badly, if we see people um, uh, acting badly towards us, then it's something that we remember uh, for a very, very long time. Confirmation bias, whatever we believe about people is something that will look for signals in order to confirm and uh, so forth. Um, let me see if uh, this is uh, 
yeah, maybe we don't need to do this. I'll just I'll just ask you. Uh, when I tell you about classic findings about human nature in social psychology, what classic findings uh, can you think about? What did you learn about in the uh, intro to social psychology that tells us about uh, human nature? What? Yeah, Stanford prison experiment. Yeah, what, what can you tell us about this? Um, college. Yeah. Okay. Right. And they, I, I, I'm not sure whether they get the instruction to what the students can do or not. Right. But over time, they find that the jailer becomes more uh, violent and kind of aggressive towards the prisoners. Yeah, excellent. Perfect. That's one that we're going to talk about today. Thank you for that. Uh, who has heard of the Stanford prison experiment before? Yeah, most of us, right? Yeah, very good. Uh, so that's that's a classic one. We need to revisit uh, that one. Uh, any other effects that you've heard about, remember, regarding human nature? What else do we know? Electric shock? Yeah. Well, what do you remember, even if you don't remember the name? Yes, exactly. So there's a lot going on in this experiment. It's called the Milgram uh, experiments with uh, shocks. Uh, actually, no shocks uh, take place, uh, but definitely there's an experiment where people think that they have that they're shocking other people, and then there's a person with a lab coat that looks like an experimenter saying, uh, "For the experiment, you must proceed." So even though uh, there's like an increasing level of shock and people um, give more and more shocks. And then at some point they hear the other person suffering, so they want to stop. And then the experimenter tells them, you must proceed for the experiment. And then they just go all the way, giving a deadly dose of shock. Terrific, Milgram, that's another one that we need to talk about. Very good. Anything else that you remember? What else comes to mind? Another one, yeah? Or or the gang files against each other, or the children, although all of them are children, and they're grouped into two groups, and told that they need to compete with each other. And they, they, they thought like the others are like very bad um, people, like boys, they're so easy to like, attack against them. But later on, when they meet each other, they the yeah very good um so actually the game that i was going to play uh, we're not going to do this uh, especially now but it's basically about in group out group so i've run this in in various cases before i was trying to find like something to separate you into two random groups sometimes i do this with uh, um, casual shoes and sports shoes sometimes i do this with black t-shirts and white t-shirts um yeah, it needs it needs to be like completely completely random. It needs to be something that is is shared. Uh, and then it, what we do uh, is actually is kind of like we have observers, and they are just supposed to code whether people are, are saying something positive or saying something uh, negative about the other group. And there's competition for some resources. And basically, the competition is to uh, come up with as many reasons why the other group wears sports shoes or wears a black t-shirt. It's amazing to see that within a very short time, almost every time that I run this, within one minute, they start saying good things about their own group and very bad things about their the other group, even though it could be that the day before they were wearing sports shoes or they were wearing their white t-shirt, right? But there is something about a group coming together for whatever reason that gets them to really diss the other, the other group. Uh, but there are some interventions in order to bring those together afterward and see how to overcome this sort of thing. But it's so easy to divide us into groups. So sometimes I really worry about dividing you into teams and keeping you in those teams, um, especially when there's uh, kind of like an unspoken competition. So yeah, a very good one. Yeah, thanks for that. <clears throat> The first one that I want to share with you uh, is a classic uh, study. It's very, very rare uh, that these uh, show up in the, the, the big journals. Uh, here, 
uh, I need to kind of like get your prediction. Um, basically, what I ask from you typically is this. Um, let's say in the US, just think about it. You don't have to answer this on the on the Mentimeter. Uh, but I'll tell you what it is that they did. They went around the world and they lost wallets on purpose with details in these wallets. Whenever I dream of running social psychology experiments, this is the kind of stuff that I dream of. Getting enough uh, money, funding, in order to go around the world and just lose wallets. <laughs> So they put the details of the people in the wallets. They also leave different sums of money. Different wallets have more, have less, or have no money whatsoever. And then the research question is, uh, which country, which people will return, tend to return the wallets more? Would they tend to re return the wallets when there is more money or when there is uh, no money? Which country would do in, in, what, in what case? And they've asked people to predict. They've asked uh, students, they've asked experts, and they've asked people in the streets, like, what do you think the result is going to be? Uh, what's your intuition tell you? Uh, what is the most likely case for people to uh, return the wallets? If there's more money, less money, uh, no money. Which one was, is the highest rate of return for wallets? A lot of money. Why is that? What's your rationale? Mm. Mm. And for no money, it, it doesn't have any money, no need to like me have to put the effort to return the board. Okay. If it's a large amount, yeah. the sense of guilt, if I take it away, and the sense of loss, yeah. Right. Maybe I would Right. So it sounds like you have an assumption about g guilt, right? <laughs> so we are good. Therefore, what we aim for is to help the other person. Therefore, if we keep that money, then we'll feel more guilty about this. Very good. What's an alternative hypothesis to this? What could be the opposite from this? <clears throat> right. So we can have a lot of hypotheses based on our what our assumption is about uh, humankind, right? Uh, are we good or are we bad? So... I think many people's assumptions is that we're very selfish. So we want the money. If we see a wallet with a lot of money, the more money there is in there, the less likely we're going to give it back because we want that money. You know, it's, uh, it's kind of tempting us to keep it, right? About the alternative one is that we're, we're good. And if there's a lot of money, we think that the other person is going to miss that money. Therefore, we should send it to them. So I just thought... Terrific. You know, this is the kind of research that we should be doing in order to try and understand what human uh, nature is. This is what they did. So they did this in 355 cities in 40 countries with 17,000 lost wallets. That's terrific. Uh, different amounts of money. Uh, citizens were more uh, willing, uh, more likely to return wallets that contain more money. So this is kind of like uh, the general assumption, very, very much in line with what, with what you were saying. Um, let me see some of the uh, findings together with you. Why does this not move? Okay, go away. Yeah. Um, this is the breakout to countries. So have a look at this and see if there's something like stands out to you. What would you say about the differences between different countries all the way, you know, Switzerland up there in the top. Uh, here's the, a, a bit more of a, a comparison between Poland, the United Kingdom, United States. But looking at all of this, uh, what you can see is that, um, you know, we've got the no money one is the orange one, and with money is the red one. And the red one almost always, aside from maybe Mexico and Peru, um, the, the red one is always higher uh, than, the, than the no money. Uh, what other things stand to you? What other things do you notice? What's the first thing that we do when we see a country comparison? We look for a country that we recognize, right? So, of course, I, I grew up in Israel. So, the first thing that I do is like, where is Israel? Where is Israel? Oh, here, there it is. Okay. In the middle. <laughs> not too good, not too bad, right? Uh, what do you think happened when this was uh, uh, published? Big headlines in South China Morning Post. <laughs> Why? Because of this, this here, right? I'll tell you something about this in a second. 
Uh, anything else aside from Israel and China here? Something that you want to raise or talk about? Yeah, Scandinavia. Right. Uh, yeah, what, what's, what's special about the, these countries? Yeah, small populations. Yeah. Very good welfare. Yeah. Yeah. Equality, egalitarian society is very, 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 very true. And here we have a bit more of like uh, developing countries or struggling countries. You know, you can try and categorize these in all sorts of different ways, but obviously it like shifts, shifts all over. Uh, and we can ask ourselves like, what, what does this uh, represent? When we see this kind of thing, so obviously there's a pattern here in a country pattern. W what kind of questions do we want to ask ourselves? Who ran the study? So let's see who ran the study. Looking from the name, it's not somebody from uh, this region, right? So we've got uh, Cohen, uh, Tenenbaum. <laughs> Christians are not uh, Eastern Asian developing country names, uh, definitely uh, a Western one. So one of the ma major criticism, every time you do a, a major stuff like that, that makes the West really look good and the East look not so good, uh, you, you immediately ask, so who ran the study? Did they also include other people from around the world before they ran this? Or did they just go to like China and start throwing uh, wallets around, <laughs> right? So that's already interesting. Something to think about. If you ever run this kind of study, uh, then what would you want to take into consideration? What I also wanted to show you is what people predicted will happen. So before they ran the study, they asked people, what do you think will happen? So um, this is the actual reporting. So people gave uh, people returned more wallets when it was big money. But actually, they asked non-expert sample, what do you think will happen? And these are the predictions. People predicted that people would keep uh, the wallets with more money. Uh, and if they ask experts, experts, I think that's going to be about the same. But still, people will give wallets less when it has uh, more money. Um, so this pattern, uh, we have a good prediction here. But this pattern surprised almost everybody, both experts and, and non-experts. But what's to happen? Um, what's going on with China? So this is the headline from South China Morning Post. Before I show you this, I want to ask you, what could be an explanation for why China is like the, the lowest one here? Like what would be a, a good uh, thing that differentiates China from all the rest when it comes to losing wallets? What kind of things do we need to take into consideration when we look at culture or when we look at countries? We don't use wallets anymore. Can you please explain to somebody who has not been in mainland China what does that mean? Okay. Uh -huh. I can't remember what the last time I'm buying or find us or look for wallet on the street. Yeah. So it's not a habit for people to pick up things on the floor. Yeah. Or use cash. People just don't use cash. You want to say something? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, not to the same extent. Yeah, super cash. Also Netherlands and the Scandinavians, very cash, right. Yeah, I have to say, last time I visited men in China, just before the pandemic, um, I was trying to pay for things because I don't have WeChat. Um, it's kind of like a different WeChat for Hong Kong. I don't know, it's like a whole procedure especially now they tighten things up. I don't have all the other stuff. Uh, Alipay did not have a Hong Kong version then. It, it has one now. Uh, a bunch, I was trying to pay taxi people, vendors in the street for street food. I was trying to pay them with cash. They would not take my money. It's the only barcode. <laughs> Got a, lo a lot of trouble with this. So it's unbelievable. I did not understand just the extent to which uh, China just completely shifted. That. So that's one excellent explanation. What else can explain this? What else is different about China? W one main issue is that people in China just don't use email in the same uh, way. Instructions, what were the instructions? How did you find the instructions? And then 
just generally what being a receptionist or a barista in a place like uh, men in China would be compared to a place like Germany or the Scandinavian countries, right? So all of this was discussed very uh, bluntly in South China Morning Post. And I did like with Google Translate, try to read some of the men in China sites. People were very upset about this. So um, Here's a Wu Lin, a Wuhan University professor of sociology, public trust. So this is a bit unnerving, but there were many, maybe some problems uh, in the methods. Uh, it studied a very specific group of people, receptionists working at the counter, uh, reception, area staff, uh, the world's most populous country, often work under high pressure and uh, strain. The receptionist might have put it aside because the wallet contained no little money. There was no important personal uh, information, blah, blah, blah. And in addition, people just like use uh, WeChat. There was no, they should have just left a WeChat account um, name instead of an email. People don't use cash, uh, like a bunch of things that I did not immediately think of. But then when I recalled my last visit to manager, I'm like, yeah, I, I could see that. So, um, for the few years, uh, the last year, the, the last three years since the thing came out, I told my students uh, from Man in China, like, if you want to run a replication of this with me in Man in China, I really want to. Uh, no longer needed uh, because they did this. Uh, somebody ran a replication of this uh, in China uh, in order to address the, the controversy. So we conducted an extended replication study in China utilizing email response and wallet recovery to assess uh, the civil honesty. We found significantly higher civic honesty in China uh, when they did their own thing. So I just want to leave this out there. Need to be very careful uh, when we jump uh, to conclusions, but generally, uh, definitely in the first study uh, with most of the world, but also in this study that revisited things in China, seems like uh, people just gave back uh, a lot more. Um, here they do like a reanalysis of uh, the whole thing, who gives back. They also kind of like did uh, try to replicate the same cities that were in the first one. So I just, I just love this. One of the famous studies that we did not discuss, uh, that was not raised by you, but is very, very famous, is the bystander effect. Have you heard of the bystander effect? Who heard of this? Yeah. Uh, somebody wants to tell me what they heard about bystander effect? What, what have you heard? Yes. Oh, wow. You know her name. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Kitty. Wow. What a story that was. Uh, you remember when, when that was around? A little bit later, yeah, but uh, it really changed things in New York. It really like boosted everything up. So bystander effect, the whole study started with Kitty Genovese because people wanted to understand what happened with them. Uh, just want to start this off with the stand-up comedian, a very cynical guy that I listen to quite a lot. Um, I like living here. You'll see things in New York you don't see other places. Yeah. I was walking on Fifth Avenue. I came across a man that was laying there on Fifth Avenue bleeding. Other people walking by him. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I was the only one, the only one that had my phone out recording him. <laughs> so that's like a different take to the whole bystander effect. Um, let me just show you a video about uh, a BBC take on the whole thing. Watch a pickpocket in action. The woman with the rucksack is his victim, and the man in the grey top on the left is the thief. Except they're both acting. In fact, everyone in the queue is with us, apart from the man in the blue shirt. As the thief moves in, will our bystander notice? He clearly has. What's more, he's seen that other people in the queue have noticed too. Now, what's he going to do about it? The answer is nothing. After all, no one else in the queue reacts, so why should he? Chances are, you wouldn't have done anything either. Whatever the man in the blue shirt thinks he's seen, he's influenced by the apathy of everyone else in the queue. In more serious situations, this could have disturbing consequences. Liverpool Street Station in London. A drunk lies on the pavement. 
In fact, he's our actor, Peter, but these passers-by aren't to know that. And since he looks the worse for wear, not critically ill, they ignore him. Helping would be inconvenient or even risky. He lies there for 20 minutes and no one raises an eyebrow. This time, we've dressed Peter as a respectable city gent. How long before he's rescued now that he looks the part? Hello, sir. How are you today? I'm all right, then. Six seconds. She even calls him sir. And suddenly, everyone's a good Samaritan. Do you suffer from epilepsy? No. While you're lying on the floor in the rain? After a couple of minutes, even the police turn up. I would just hate to be in this position of feeling ill um, and nobody helping and walking past, so I'd just like to check that he was OK. I thought, well, it's wet, so he must really be ill. He's going to ruin the suit anyway. <laughs> Our actress Ruth takes Peter's place. She's not a drunk, but she's also not a city gent. How long before she gets help? have passed and 34 people have passed. People don't really want to know that they just haven't got the time. Well, they have got the time, they just don't want to get involved. But it's more complicated than that. If the street were deserted, a passerby would probably go to the rescue. But these strangers have silently formed a temporary group with a rule. Don't help. This woman, for instance, has clearly spotted Ruth but she conforms to the rule and does nothing. You're right. You're right. Watch what happens, though, when someone else helps. You're right. You're sure? She suddenly finds herself in a different group with a new rule to help. She doesn't look well, does she? Uh, You're right, yeah. You're sure? First I thought she was dead. Then I saw, checked to see if she was breathing or not. And I looked around and I couldn't believe that no one had noticed her because there was a bloke sat there just absorbed in reading a newspaper. Peter's now having the same problem. This time, we've swapped his suit for casual clothes. He's not drunk, and we've asked him to act like he's in pain. Oh. Help! Help! Uh, help me! Please, somebody! Help me! Help me, somebody! Please help me! Help me! Help me. Help me. Please, somebody help me. Please, somebody help me. Yeah, that's that. The last part is difficult to, to watch, uh, although I've watched this uh, many times. It's a, it's a powerful story, the story of a bystander effect. And uh, lots, lots of things uh, that we can take away from this uh, BBC summary of the bystander effect. What, what did you notice? What did you take away from this uh, video? Yeah, social status matters. So if you never need help, best to have a suit on. Yeah, good. What, what else did you see? Very important, social status. What else? Yeah. Yeah. The perceived norms, the rules that kind of uh, happen in the situation, what we see others do and not do. So very much related to the story of, of Kitty Genovese, right? Um, so originally what this was about is that just like they said in the uh, in the video, it seems like if there's just like us there and there's nobody else, uh, people are more likely to help. So their classic study showed 85% uh, would be willing to help. But if there's other people and all of them are not doing anything, one of them is reading a newspaper just next to them, many people are just walking by being very, very busy, uh, we see them not act, we also don't act. There's lots of reasons for that. Maybe we think, okay, so somebody has looked into it and it's not a big problem. Maybe they you know, uh, have all sorts of justifications uh, for that. 
uh, a meta-analysis that was done about 15 years later, so 1981, showed that 10 years of uh, research of the bystander effect, robust across all emergency types and populations, while overall helping may increase or decrease because of variety of issues, the pattern of less helping with bystanders stood up. So they came up with all these things. So this is already like uh, 40, 50 uh, years old. With a lot of challenges, first, do people really notice the event? Does it really register? They're very busy with their lives. Once they register this, how do they interpret this? And there's a lot of these cognitive biases about the you know, illusion of transparency when we're in pain and when we're suffering, or in this case, when we're giving a talk, standing in front of a class, uh, we think, of course, everybody can see that we're, you know, we're in need of help. We're in need of somebody to tell us. Uh, we have something in our teeth or something is not happening in the presentation. I don't know. It's so obvious that I need help so much. But people in the audience, it's like, uh, maybe she needs help. Maybe the instructor needs help, but nobody else is doing anything. So uh, why should I, right? And definitely influences of uh, social status. So I really like studies like this. Also stuff that I want to run. Uh, to see kinds of donations, whether you're wearing a suit or not wearing a suit. So it's this guy over here uh, that kind of like was a homeless guy, exactly the same sign, exactly the same spots, you know, did the randomized, all sorts of things. The only thing that changed was, you know, the haircut and the, and the suit. And it seems like just people contribute more to uh, people of, of higher social status. Um, so even when begging for money, it's not so much about looking the part, it's more about you know, people try to help uh, others more. So we'll take a, a five minute break, uh, think about these findings and then I'll come back and I'll tell you uh, my take of Kitty Genovese and the bystander effect. For a very long time, I did not uh, question this, uh, this story. However, about four or five years ago, the person who uh, murdered Kitty Genovese was in jail, uh, died in prison at the age of 80, 81. Um, and then I just saw all sorts of very weird things. And I want to play this video to you. And I want you to think very carefully what is going on here. So what is the famous Kitty Genovese case? And is there enough? Okay. So watch this very, very carefully and make up your own mind about what happened with Kitty. Her name was Kitty Genovese, a woman whose murder became infamous the world over because nobody tried to save her. Listen to how it was reported. At least 38 residents of this apartment building heard her screams and did nothing. That's the legacy of Kitty Genovese, who was murdered in Queens, New York in 1964. Her story is taught in psychology classes, and her name is synonymous with people who look the other way when trouble happens. Nothing. No witnesses, just a lot of listeners. It's the post Kitty Genovese era. No one wants to look. They think they'll get involved. In 1964, Kitty Genovese was murdered outside her home in the middle of the night. Incredibly, last Sunday's episode of HBO's Girls featured a staged reenactment of the Kitty Genovese case. Dad, I think there's a lady in the courtyard. It can't be anything good this time of night. Hearing of Winston Mosley's death, Girls creator Lena Dunham wrote on Instagram, Today we learn her killer has died. Spooky timing. Rest in peace, Kitty. So what really happened the night Kitty Genovese was murdered? Kevin Cook is the author of Kitty Genovese, the murder, the bystanders, the crime that changed America. The idea that New Yorkers watched and did nothing, didn't lift a finger to help this poor dying girl, stuck in the public mind, but it was a lot more complicated than that. It happened here. Kitty Genovese was almost home when she heard a man's footsteps behind her. She ran, but the man caught up to her and stabbed her twice in the back. She screamed, oh God, I've been stabbed. What happened next? That's where fact and fiction take separate paths. He fled. She turned and went back around this corner. Kitty was attacked by a man named Winston Mosley. The author says the fact that she was able to walk after the initial attack probably led corner. people to believe so they didn't have to call the night. cops. People are looking out their windows. They see Kitty Genovese here. They see her struggle to her feet. She staggers around this corner into the darkness and is no longer visible to so the she's people. She's no longer visible to the people over here. It was past 3 a.m. 
Thinking the trouble was over, people went back to bed. They were unaware that a wounded Kitty Genovese was still in mortal danger. Kitty sought shelter in here. She was able to get into this door. That's when Mosley returned and raped and stabbed Kitty to death in this vestibule. According to Cook, a man at the top of the stairs saw it happen, but did nothing to stop it. A tragic story, but it got much worse two weeks later when a front page story in the New York Times declared 37 who saw murder didn't call the police. The author says that number was totally distorted. It was certainly dozens of ear witnesses and eyewitnesses, but when you talk about the people who both heard something or saw something and knew what it meant, knew what was going on, I don't think it's more than uh, half a dozen. And Cook says one neighborhood man remembers his dad calling the cops on that fateful night. He swears that his father did call the police, was put on hold, told the police there's a woman staggering around out there she's been beaten up you need to come there was no answer to that call in those days there was no 911 system that's something that grew out of the kitty genovese case so the legend of kitty genovese was born so already we can see from this that the story is not as straightforward as we thought first of all it seems like somebody did call the police only then they did not have 911 it was three in the morning it was not in the main street it was where she stumbled into and opened the door. But since then, because of this, people went back to look at what happened with Kitty Genovese and investigate this. And actually, there are now academic articles that have looked at all the archives and interviewed everybody that was there. And here, American psychologists, so it's under the social psychology kind of like umbrella. This is what they uh, claim. This is not supported by the available evidence. There is no evidence for the presence of 38 witnesses or that the witnesses observed murder or that the witnesses uh, remained uh, inactive. So we have here um, a book, No One Helped, uh, just like the, the other book. Um, so it incorrectly identified 38 indifferent witnesses fueling fears of apathy and urban decay. But actually, in practice, uh, what has happened is that um, article grossly exaggerated the number of witnesses and what they had perceived. Many years after the New York Times came with this horrible headline saying that uh, people were uh, apathic to this, the uh, New York Times corrected what it is that they reported. They had a lot of information that they did not release back then. This is actually very recent from three, four years ago. And this is what they concluded. None saw the attack in its entirety. Only a few had a glimpse of parts of it or recognized as the cries for help. Many thought that they had heard lovers or drunks quarreling. There were two attacks, not three. And afterwards, two people, two people did call the police. A 70-year-old woman at three in the morning ventured out and cradled the dying victim in her arms until they arrived. Um, to, you know, uh, the ambulance arrived and then Miss Genovese died in her arms on the way to the hospital. This is not the story that I grew up with, with Kitty Genovese. Already, there's a big distortion between the big headline from the New York Times and everything that I've been taught in social psychology and what we now know is reality. So from nobody cared to People cared, people called the police, people went out at three in the morning, 70 year old woman went out and then uh, that uh, people did react, an ambulance did come and then she died on the way to the hospital. Shocking to me, this whole thing. So this made me want to look even deeper. It's like what's happening with the bystander effect. Summary for this, another uh, uh, report at the end. This is the, the woman. Um, one neighbor actually raced from her apartment to rescue Miss Genovese, knowing she was in distress, but unaware whether her assailant was still in the scene. So actually, she thought that maybe the, the attacker was still there, and she still ventured out uh, despite, uh, despite her age. So it's clear that she went into great efforts to save and comfort Kitty, giving the, uh, the lie to the idea that no one helped and no one cared. So a completely, a completely different story. 
So one of the things that we want to do when we look at the bystander effect and other things, did this really happen, not happen, is look at the meta-analysis. And this is a fairly recent meta-analysis in 2011, looking at all the uh, summaries of all the bystander effect studies. And this is what they found. There is an overall effect size of G0.35. This means like a small effect. However, there are moderators, and these moderators are actually very, very important for when people are deciding not to intervene. The bystander effect was attenuated, was weaker, when the situations were perceived as dangerous. When things were perceived as dangerous, people were more inclined to come and help. Perpetrators were present. The attackers were still there. So if there's a perpetrator that's, that's uh, uh, in, in the scene, people are more likely to come and help and intervene. And the cost of the interventions were physical. So the more dangerous the situation is, the more likely that the people are going to get hurt, the more likely people are to come out and help. This is an important moderator for the bystander effect. This is not what I was taught when I was an undergraduate in psychology. So... If you go and open a social psychology textbook, this is not what you're going to find. You're going to find Kitty Genovese. You're going to find a bystander from 1981. This is the stuff that we need to be talking about. Finally, is the bystander effect a myth? I love this uh, video and I love this uh, study. This is the most uh, recent one that I've seen and uh, really gets you to rethink everything about this whole bystander effect myth. being individuals that are only interested in our own interests, that is not how it works. The myth is that when people observe somebody in need of help in public, then they have a tendency to kind of just stand there and look at each other. Our research shows that that's not at all what's happening. from pretty low-scale conflicts to stabbings and really severe violence. In all types of situations, they try to de-escalate the conflict. They put themselves between the conflict parties, trying to pull them apart. So is it always a good idea to play an active role, you know? Is it also a good idea to be active if you are in an armed robbery situation? We were surprised by the high frequency of it, and we were also surprised by seeing similar frequencies in these three different countries that we looked at. As a cultural anthropologist, I would have expected pretty big cultural differences. But what we see is that there are some universal features in these very tense situations. A lot of social psychologists would be pretty upset if I would say that I disproved it. In many ways, I think we did, but the point is that they've been looking at something else and what we've been looking at. So our point now is a bit, you know, now with the CCTV footage, we can actually gain understanding of human behavior in a way that we haven't been able to get before. Violence and aggression, you can't study that in a lab setting. The urgency is different in real life. So that idea if you stumble when you enter the subway and people will not help you, I mean, that's not what we see. That's an idea that we all have, but that's not how the reality works. Yeah, I think it's brilliant that they did a follow up to this. So this is this is the study. Um, so they actually went and took the footage, all footage possible from a CCTV, tracked all of this and saw all the dangerous situation and tried to code this. And it's really remarkable when you think about this, that like 90% of all uh, instances 
people helped despite the police telling them not to help, despite them being in danger for helping. I think it's just uh, outstanding. And since then, a bunch of other things uh, started to, to come out. Uh, this is from the same, uh, the same group. Uh, in the presence of dangerous bystanders were 19 times more likely to intervene than the absence of, of danger. So it seems like this is a very different story than everything I've been led to believe in what's in our textbooks uh, in social psychology. Um, in addition, uh, people say the world is becoming a lot more isolated. You know, we're all in our mobiles. We don't care about one another. But actually, if we study this, even in the lab, looking at co cooperation, when we do prisoner dilemmas and a bunch of other social uh, games, we can see that actually over time, there is an increase in cooperation overall. And there's a bunch of studies that uh, try to uh, summarize this entire literature and um, and, and conclude that, that actually cooperation is not declining. If anything, it's increasing uh, over time. So all these things about, you know, back then, back then in the day, in the 1950s, things used to be so, it really was not the case. Nowadays, we're much more connected and we care about one another a lot more uh, th than we did. Uh, there is, seems to be, uh, one uh, thing that's very noticeable that seems to moderate this, unfortunately, in Hong Kong, this is like a big, a big issue. It's the Gini coefficient, and the Gini coefficient is the the gap between the very wealthy and the very uh, poor, and whether this is visible or not. So whether you see the very rich versus the very poor. Um, so in Scandinavian countries, maybe not so much. Things are very egalitarian. But in Hong Kong, you can see very clearly who has the, the more, more money. And it does seem like the uh, inequality in society and whether wealth is visible or invisible really affects the level of cooperation. So uh, when there's a lot of inequality and wealth is visible, then people tend to cooperate uh, less. Um, we still need more findings about this, but, you know, a big, big nature study um, made a lot of headlines uh, with this. This is good initial exploratory findings, but this is just to say that the story about cooperation, the story about bystander effect and helping one another, another is really just the beginning of the whole thing. We really need to look into this uh, with cool studies like lost wallets and trying to get an understanding of, of who we are. Stanford prison experiment. Uh, I think we all know this. We've heard about this. Uh, there's already a problem with me calling this an experiment because it's not an experiment. So I think most of us uh, tend to assume that people were randomly assigned to be jailers or prisoners. This is definitely not the case. Everything about this Stanford so-called experiment uh, is flawed. Uh, if you're not familiar with this, uh, there's a link here. Go and watch the video to become more familiar with the, the whole thing. Uh, and I think it's really an overblown uh, story. Uh, so many times when people say it's very easy to corrupt us, just give us the right setting and we're going to uh, all become uh, very hostile and 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 aggressive. So I like this cartoon. I base my view of home, human nature on six days long study of 22 non-random young males in which the experimenter was an active participant. I think that summarizes everything about what Zimbardo did here. I personally have a big problem with Zimbardo. Many in the open science community have a problem with, it, with him. Not only was this uh, very questionably uh, done, uh, eth ethically questionable, but uh, everything about the way that he executed this uh, was more like a theater stage, staged uh, uh, performance rather than uh, a real a real experiment. Uh, here is a summary. Samin Vazir is the incoming editor of Psychological Science, a big uh, proponent proponent of open science. Uh, here is the headline that came out in the New York Post in 2018: "Famed Stanford Prison Experiment Was a Fraud." And here's what she writes, psychologists, please read this. We must stop celebrating this work. In, it's anti-scientific. Get it out of the textbooks. So we really need to stop talking about this. And we need to hail Zimbardo rather than a, a good scientist that sh has shown us something more uh, as um, close to, to a fraud or, or at least a very big lie about this uh, whole thing. Yeah, let's see. I, I had really thought that I was incapable of this kind of behavior.
it was more like a bunch of students doing improv. Uh, un unbelievable. There's like everything about the story is absolutely un unbelievable. And Zimbardo for many years was held as like our top psychologist. Here's one of the many articles that came out uh, since then, 2018, showing many, many problems. How did this come to be? Stanford just opened the archives and showed us the notes and the recordings that Zimbardo kept from all that time ago. And it seems like many, many things were just like completely uh, staged. Uh, there's a lot to read in there. I really recommend that you go into uh, look into this. Uh, Zimbardo kind of denies the whole thing and uh, says that this is only part of the story. And there's a lot more going on uh, than this. But overall, in general, it seems like he not only intervened, but he uh, prepped everybody to uh, to stage act the, the whole thing. Since then, many other headlines came out, uh, massively influential. We just learned that this is a fraud. Uh, and I don't know why, but it's still in our textbooks. This is what we teach in Introduction to Social Psychology. Um, yeah, so a series of uh, papers started to come out. Once again, American psychologist tries to set the uh, the record straight. And here is some of the uh, things that were uh, said. These new criticisms include the biased and incomplete collection of data, the extent to which uh, the Stanford prison experiment drew on prison experiment devised and conducted by the students in one of Zimbardo's classes three months earlier. This seems like he did kind of like a simulation in his classes. He involved some of his postgraduates. They designed what it is that's going to happen in this uh, thing. And then uh, by being active participants in the study, they influenced other to do all sorts of things. The fact that the guards were not told that they were subjects, the fact that participants were almost never completely immersed in the situation, a bunch of things. It's like it's it's an unbelie uh, unbelievable uh, thing that that happened. I don't want to pay a lot of attention to this because if you want, you can get that information that has completely been debunked. Whenever somebody tells you something about Stanford Prison Experiment, uh, just uh, take it in perspective that a lot of problems with the study. But I think the more important question is, what happens if we do this well? And the question is, can we replicate this? So for a very long time, we social psychologists were thinking, uh, can, we, can we run the study? A bit like with the trolley dilemma, I was asking you, can we do this with uh, real people or not? And Ova says, of course not. But then what happened? A TV show, a TV show decided to do so what happened here? Yes, a TV show. Uh, once again, yeah, BBC came out with this. It's called The Experiment. Um, they ran this. So what happened when the BBC decided to rerun the Stanford Prison Experiment once again? Here's what happened. There's an upside and there's a downside. Unlike the prisoners, the guards failed to identify with their role. They made, <laughs> this made the guards reluctant to impose their authority reluctant to impose their authority, and they were eventually overcome by the prisoners. <laughs> Participants then established an egalitarian social system. At some point, they're all like sat together holding hands and uh, singing songs, <laughs> establishing a democracy together. However, when this proved unsustainable, they moved to impose a tier <laughs> A tyranny uh, that met with weakening resistance. So some of them were trying to say, maybe we can like influence this situation and form a tyranny. So a lot of interesting things happening uh, over there. Here's a summary from the person who ran this. So they uh, took a social psychology to uh, run the whole thing. What is the key take home message from the study? first thing we would say is that no, people don't automatically or naturally act in terms of the roles in which, to which they're thrust by others. How they behave depends upon their own willingness to identify with the group. Okay? The second uh, point that we make is that in groups, people are empowered to act upon group norms. Okay? But as a consequence, group behavior is neither good nor bad in and of itself. How people behave 
depends upon the content, the culture, the norms of that specific group. And if there are problems, if there's a pathology, it doesn't lie at the psychological level, it lies, if you like, at the normative, the cultural and ideological level. Our point is that it's not the group psychology itself is bad, it's that uh, groups can be bad when they act in terms of toxic ideologies. But the third message that w was the unexpected message and came from unexpected findings in the studies is that while we would strongly assert that groups and group power are not in and of themselves a problem, the failure of groups is a problem. We saw the norms shift towards norms that are more toxic. interesting in the study came out of uh, things where we didn't achieve what we meant to achieve. So for instance, in, in our study, what happened was that the, um, uh, the prisoners identified with the group, okay, especially after we made some theoretical interventions, uh, which we thought would impact on identity, and they did, did. So the prisoners became a group. Because they had a shared identity, they supported each other, and they became powerful as a result. Now the unexpected finding had to do with the guards. We thought, and here we followed Zimbardo, we thought, well the guards, you know, they're, they're, the, they're the powerful group, they're the group on top, they're the group uh, with all the resources, they'll identify with the group and therefore um, they too will be powerful. So we'll see an interesting clash between uh, one group that is structurally powerful, the guards, and one group that becomes powerful as they identify together, the, the, the prisoners. In the event what happened was that the guards were incredibly reticent to assume their power. They didn't identify as guards. I'm going to stop it here, but I encourage you to go and watch the whole thing. Uh, fa fascinating stuff, really uh, outstanding. Which leaves us, so Stanford prison experiment, probably a problem. Bystander effect, probably a problem. Some indication with lost wallets uh, that things are going well. Cooperation is increasing, uh, not decreasing. What about the Milgram experiments with the shock? Uh, if you're not familiar with Milgram, uh, there's like a bunch of links here that you can go and, and watch this, but I'm assuming that many of us uh, know and understand this. Unfortunately, as much as I would have hoped that we would debunk Milgram, we've tried to replicate Milgram again and again uh, many times and succeeded uh, very well. So it seems like when there's a person in a white coat telling you the experiment must proceed, therefore shock another person who is in pain all the way to deadly uh, dosage, seems to uh, happen with the majority of participants, uh, regardless of where you are in the world and what happens in these kinds of situations. So here's one uh, replication, obedience rates in 2006 replication were only slightly lower than the one in Milgram 45 years earlier. Another TV show. <laughs> Uh, very briefly, I'll just show you what it is that they concluded. In the original Milgram experiment, psychologists were asked to predict how many people would continue to the point that they were administering the highest shock on the board. Their prediction was one-tenth of one percent. They were wrong. The results of our experiment were almost identical to the original. Over 50 percent of participants continued up to 450 volts. The majority of people will administer lethal electric shocks just because a guy in a white coat is telling them to. 450 volts. 450 volts. 450 volts. 450. Interesting TV show. Uh, a meta-analysis. So what happens when you take all of the replications of Milgram and put them together? It seems like uh, yeah, around uh, many samples, it's about the same overall rate. Uh, 43.6, here's one recent, re relatively recent, 2015 from Poland. Results achieved show a level of participants' obedience towards instructions similarly high to that of the original Milgram experiments. Um, it does seem like there are some moderators, and I think this is the more interesting aspect of when do people shock, and it seems like I don't know if you can see this, so I'll make this a little bit bigger. When people rebel, when you see other people rebel, you're much more likely to, uh, likely to rebel. If there's no feedback whatsoever and you just like need to proceed, then people shock the most. Um, so it just depends on like levels of what happens in the environment. 
Uh, but seeing other people stand up to something um, seems like it really helps to uh, weaken this uh, this effect. So we went through a journey here. There are a lot more studies that I would like to share with you, but we only have like one session to dedicate to this. I really wanted you to go back into social psychology classic findings and revisit the assumption that came from the studies in the 1960s and 1970s following the Second World War that we're inherently bad, that something, if just given the circumstances, we would be selfish, we would not help, we would not intervene, we would hurt other people, we would live up to our authority and abuse others. This does not seem to be uh, the case. Um, however, there, there does seem to be something going on. So for example, this thing about in-group, out-group is very much alive. It seems uh, fairly easy to uh, activate this which is why I'm generally very hesitant, you know, when we're talking about sports clubs or even nationalities or religions or, you know, anything that we look, anything that splits us into different categories. I'm, I'm very reluctant to uh, take any part in any of this uh, because generally we have a lot more in common than we have. Uh, and everything just seems randomly. I was randomly born in this circumstance with this social status in this ethnicity with this nationality. There's nothing in that situation that came for me and my freedom to, to choose. So we just need to, uh, understand that there's no clear evidence that human nature is inherently bad. The classic findings sometimes are fraud, like Stanford prison experiment, uh, or biased and flawed. Um, sometimes we just don't have the full picture, uh, like the New York Times with uh, Kitty Genovese. Uh, but there is something about the way that we react to in-group, out-group, and the way that we react to authority, unfortunately. Final words, going back all the way to Rodger. I want you to hear this uh, from him. To me, hearing him is uh, quite inspirational. I, I encourage you to read the book, uh, Humankind. And uh, yeah, I'll let him wrap up this uh, story of how he sees this. My name is Rutger Bregman, and I'm the author of the new book, Humankind, A Hopeful History. It's a book about a simple but quite radical idea. What if most people, deep down, are pretty decent? In the past 15 to 20 years, there has been a silent revolution in science. Scientists from very diverse disciplines, uh, psychologists, anthropologists, archaeologists, sociologists, have moved from a quite cynical view of human nature to a much more positive and hopeful view. And I've actually been arguing that we are hardwired to be friendly and to cooperate, and that actually this is our true superpower as a species. Now, I think this is a quite revolutionary idea because what you assume in other people is what you get out of them. If you assume that most people deep down are just selfish, as we have been assuming for the past 30 to 40 years, then you'll start designing your institutions around that idea, right? Your schools, your workplaces, your democracies, and that's what you'll get out of people. What you assume in other people is what you get out of them. Now, if we move to a new, more hopeful, more realistic view of human nature, I think that changes everything. And it's also a quite subversive idea. Because if we don't trust each other, if we think that, you know, people are deep down are just selfish, then we need them, you know, then we need the CEOs and the presidents and the bureaucrats and the generals and the monarchs and the kings and you name it. We need those in power to keep each other in check. But if we actually believe in each other, if we believe that most people can be trusted, then we can move to a very different kind of society, a much more egalitarian kind of society where, yeah, we bring out the best in each other. That's the simple but quite radical idea that I'm defending in my uh, book, Humankind, A Hopeful History. Now, it's a strange time to be publishing a book. I've worked on this for five years. Uh, for five years I've tried to connect the dots and I'm just trying to show that there's something bigger going on here because there are so many brilliant specialists who have been working on this new view of human nature but they often don't realize um, from each other that they're not alone. So at one point I was interviewing a psychologist who had been do doing 
fascinating work on the so-called bystander theory, which is the idea that during times of crises or when there's an emergency, say someone's drowning or you know, someone's attacked in the street, that we don't help. And this psychologist actually showed that in 90% of all cases, based on CCTV camera footage, right, so real incidents, in 90% of all cases, people actually help each other. And so I told her about new theories from biology, where biologists lately have been talking about the concept of survival of the friendliest, which has been happening in our evolution. You know, that for thousands of years, it was actually the friendliest among us who had the most kids and so had the biggest chance of passing on their genes to the next generation. And I told her about this and she said, oh my God, so it's been happening there as well. And this is the only thing that I've been trying to do is just to connect the dots, to show that there's something bigger going on, that the zeitgeist is changing and that we're moving into a new era right now.